25th meeting of the Livermore City Council. I call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Barrientos? Here. Councilmember Branning? Here. Councilmember Kick? Here. Vice Mayor Carling? Here. Mayor Marchand? Here. If you'll please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Thank you. Okay, next we're going to uh, uh, move on to 3.1, which is proclamations and presentations. Uh, we're going to confirm the advisory body appointments to the Airport Commission, uh, Alameda County uh, Mosquito Abatement District, Board of Trustees, Beautification Committee. Oh, it, it shows it's on. The, the, uh, the green light's on. Yep, okay. I'll, I'll just talk louder and stand closer. All right. Uh, with that, uh, we have the uh, uh, appointments are uh, for the Historic Preservation Commission. We have two vacancies uh, appointing Fred Cullum uh, and Neil Pan uh, for Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, we have a, uh, a nomination of Maya uh, Manoharan uh, Commission for the Arts, uh, Thomason Dewhurst, uh, Livermore Airport Commission, David Farley, uh, Livermore Library Board of Trustees, Richard Hunt, Beautification Committee, uh, Kat Weiss and Ann Brown, um, and uh, Andrew Wong. Also appointments to an unexpired and regular term, uh, Ron Kraft and Tom Bradley. Um, and uh, history, city historian um, Alan Frank. Uh, I'd ask for a, uh, uh, let's see, uh, any council questions? Any public comment? No public comment. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, I would entertain a uh, motion for approval. I move approval. Okay, motion by uh, uh, Vice Mayor Carling, second by uh, Council Member Kick. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on to a proclamation declaring March. Mayor, oh, I'm sorry. I need to administer the oath. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Since they're all here. Oh, Alan, good to see you. Yeah. If you'd be so kind as to administer the oath of office. My goodness, thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs> thank you for stepping up and volunteering uh, your time. And thank you all for volunteering your time. That's people like you that that make and keep Livermore the remarkable place that it is, is because you give the most valuable thing that you have, and that's your time. 
and uh, back to the community. So thank you all. Mr. Kraus? Ms. White? I need to shorten her name. Thank you. Ms. Dewhurst? Thank you. Mr. Cullen? Mr. Pan? Red. Mr. Wang? And city historian, Mr. Frank. All right, and uh, sorry, she just ducked out, but uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, uh, Ms. Dewhurst's uh, chops for uh, the Art Commission, she's the one that did that remarkable uh, mural of the Western Pacific Railroad Depot uh, next to uh, Common Point on, uh, on North Livermore Avenue. So it's a beautiful mural. So uh, we've got a lot of very talented people stepping up to serve in our commissions. Okay, now we'll go to the Proclamation 3.2, declaring March 2024 as March for Meals uh, Pound Save Lunch Month. Uh, and this will be presented to Carrie Old, Spectrum Meals on Wheels Program Manager. Uh, and uh, declaring March for Meals, uh, March 2024. Whereas on March 22nd, 1972, President Richard Nixon amended the Older Americans Act of 1965 establishing a national nutrition program for seniors 60 and older. And whereas 22 years ago, Meals on Wheels America initiated the March for Meals Pound Save Lunch campaign to recognize and raise awareness about the escalating problem of senior hunger in America. And whereas in partnership with Stanford Healthcare Tri-Valley, the Spectrum Community Services Meals on Wheels program in Livermore has served the community admirably for over 30 years, delivering over 34,000 nutritious meals to more than 250 homebound seniors last year alone. Stanford Healthcare Tri-Valley's menu is a model for Meals on Wheels programs nationwide, meeting the specialized dietary requirements of older adults in Livermore. And whereas the dedicated volunteers of the Spectrum Community Services Meals on Wheels program have served over 1,500 hours each year in Livermore and are the backbone of the program, providing not only nutritious meals, but also caring, concern, and attention to seniors and individuals with disabilities at significant risk of hunger and isolation. And whereas the Spectrum Community Services Meals on Wheels program helps seniors maintain health and independence, preventing unnecessary falls, hospitalizations, and premature institutionalization and provides a powerful socialization opportunity for millions, including Livermore seniors, combating the negative health effects and economic consequences of loneliness and isolation. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Livermore proclaims March 2024 as the 22nd annual March for Meals and urges residents to take this month to volunteer, donate, and honor the Meals on Wheels programs the seniors they serve, and the volunteers who care for them. Furthermore, the City Council thanks staff and volunteers with Spectrum Community Services in their efforts to combat senior hunger and isolation in Livermore and the Tri-Valley. Present this to Carrie Olds. Vice Mayor and the Mayor, Mr. Armstrong, and for those who are now with me, 
for Mills. This year, Mills on Wheels America has moved to change it to Save Lunch because we really are talking about getting that lunch to our seniors. When you talk about a march, you think we're getting out walking. We're not doing that, <laughs> but we are making sure that our seniors are fed. Um, the, the statistic that was given was strictly for Livermore. Through the Tri-Valley, we do serve in all three cities. Through the Tri-Valley, we served 70,000 meals last year and over 500 clients between the cities. We, we go five days a week, which is much more than many of the other organizations across the nation are able to do. We knock five days. For those that need it, we provide seven meals. And at the door, we are doing not just a handoff of a meal, but we're making sure that our seniors are safe, whether it be that we call their emergency contact, whether we need to make an APS report, whether we just need to help them find the resources that they need in order to stay in their home and age with dignity. It is with 90 volunteers a week that we serve over 1,500 meals a week to the Tri-Valley. And, but there is much more need for that. We are doing what we can with what funds we have available. We work very hard to do fundraising to make sure that we can continue to do so. No senior that needs the mill is turned away regardless of their ability to help pay for that mill. We will go out and raise the funds where we need to in order to make sure that our seniors are taken care of. So I wanna thank you for the proclamation. Anyone that wants to come out and volunteer can reach out to me at our volunteer website or volunteer email mow at spectrumcs.org, or you can join us at our website, again, spectrumcs.org, and there's a volunteer button, there's a donate button, and there's more information to be found there. I want to thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yes. Comment from Councilmember Kick. Yeah, so uh, for my day job, I was researching the um, OAA title uh, services and discovered that of all the Older Americans Act programs that receive funding, 56% of that is volunteer labor. So any program that goes out, the majority um, is volunteer labor. So um, just thank you for organizing those volunteers and um, just goes again to show how important it is when people give their time. So mm -hmm. I thought that was quite interesting. Very important. Any other comments? Yeah, well, Carrie, uh, uh, Carrie mentioned I was out last week and um, it's a very impressive organization and well run. I was quite impressed. Uh, I mean, I went out on one of the routes one afternoon or morning, I guess it was, but uh, to deliver to roughly 20 people with uh, a woman named Inez who does this every week. Uh, so I was out there just briefly to see what they do, but it is a tremendous organization. And if anybody's interested in either volunteering or donating, please do, because it's a wonderful program. Lots of people in need. I think the city manager went out too. Didn't you go out as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I thought. So <laughs> it's okay, Gary. It's okay. Anyway, um, thanks, Carrie, for all you do. And it's uh, it's a great thing that uh, we have for this community. Thanks. Well, and those meals are tailored to the, to the individuals. They're vegetarian. They're vegan. Uh, there was a really great looking uh, a seafood salad uh, in the group that I uh, was delivering. So, but they're all tailored meals, and it's uh, the amount of care that goes into that is really quite remarkable. All right, moving on to the uh, open forum. The uh, if you ask the city clerk, I'll, uh, how can people participate in the open forum? Thank you, Mayor. The city council's agenda provides opportunities for the public to participate in the meeting by addressing the city council in the following ways. For non-agendized items, the public has the opportunity during open forum to address the city council on any item of interest that is within the city council's subject matter jurisdiction. For agendized items, the public can address the city council on each item of business it considers when the mayor opens public comment and should be focused on that particular item. Please note, a speaker is not required to answer any questions from the city council, and the city council is not required to answer questions from the public. However, the mayor has the discretion to ask staff to address the speaker's comments when a council member believes it's relevant to a particular business item. When participating in tonight's meeting, one comment may be given per person per item. For consent calendar items, one comment may be given for the entire consent calendar. If consent calendar items are pulled for discussion by the city council, 
A speaker will be allowed one comment on the items pulled for discussion and a separate comment for the remaining consent calendar. To provide comment, please fill out and turn in a speaker card found at the entrance of the city council chambers. Speakers will be announced in the order received. Once the public comment opens, each partition, participant's name will be announced and their three minutes will begin once at the lectern. The mayor will announce the conclusion of the public comment period after comments have been voiced into the record. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take comments for 30 minutes and then uh, if they go beyond that, we'll uh, move it uh, to back to the, uh, to the end of the meeting. Uh, okay, first uh, speakers. The first speaker is David McWiggin, followed by Donna Cabane, followed by Eli Robles. Signed my statement and was left to wait, leaning on the hood of my truck until the supervisor came to release the scene. Leaning there, I started to get a chill, so I went around to the passenger door, opened it up, and put on the coat that was on the seat over the lighter coat that I had bought earlier that day at Dom's. As I closed the door, I noticed how close my wheels were to the crosswalk line, so I got down there in a catcher spot like this to get a closer look. My first thought was, dang, missed it by half the width of the line. That's because my truck pushed about half of the width over the line into the crosswalk. But then as I turned my head around the side of the bumper and looked at the curb, I could see it was really more like two thirds, but still. The reason I know with 100% accuracy that my truck ended up at approximately 20 inches into the crosswalk is that I got down and looked at it up close and personal for 10 to 15 seconds. And since I have a picture of a skid mark that the Livermore police somehow lost, it's clear you are deliberately lying again to cover up crimes committed by the Livermore police, just like you did for Officer Black. Now, some people have asked, why would the Livermore police go to such extremes, thinking that not knowing the motive somehow indicates that the police wouldn't do it? Well, back in the day before social media, there was an email chain that came around. Do you think like a psychopath? One simple question, a man goes to a funeral, he meets a woman there and finds it interesting. The next day he goes out to kill someone who is also at the funeral. Why? And I'll admit, I didn't know the answer and had to scroll down to the bottom. For those interested, the man was hoping to see the woman again at the, at the next funeral. But the only thing proven by not knowing his motivation is that you don't think like a psychopath, which is a good thing. The proper question is not why would, but why did the Livermore police go to such extremes? And it's really not that complicated. The arresting officer failed to follow procedures and created a big hole in the timeline. Then the officer parking my truck forgot to release the parking brake and accidentally corrupted the skid mark evidence. Their mistakes were causing the case to fall apart rapidly, so they decided to fix it. And since you made it abundantly clear that you encourage the police to fix things by your willful cover-up of their crimes, there isn't a deterrent in Livermore one might expect. Now, in the same way I can intellectually understand the psychopath killing another person at the funeral, I can intellectually understand your willing cover up of perjury and evidence tampering. The ends always justify the means, right, Johnny? But I do not understand your cover up of sexual assault and uh, the promotion of chief or too cheap of the man most responsible for that cover up. Just what ends are you justifying, Johnny? Clearly, I do not think like you, Johnny, and that's a good thing. You're a lying, corrupt criminal, Johnny and people are starting to find out. The next speaker is Donna Cabane, followed by Eli Robles, followed by Marty Sutton. Good evening. Why don't we have unleaded aviation fuel at Livermore Airport? What is causing the delays? This is an urgent public health and safety issue the negative impacts of lead in humans are well documented. A four-year-old who lived near LVK tested positive for lead in his blood. We need to act now. At least 10 municipal airports in California and 35 airports nationwide offer UL-94. Hayward, the other municipal airport in Alameda County, has two FBOs and both offer UL-94. How did all of these airports get UL-94 before us? Why are we last? The city manager says the air board still requires a 30-day comment period, but this can be waived for health issues. It is critical for council members to directly email Ms. Becky Yu at the air board and ask to have the permit fast-tracked. Start, please start selling UL-94 in the existing 1,000-gallon fuel tank. The city can separate the fuel contract with the FBO 
and require him to sell unleaded AV fuel. Please provide updates concerning GAMI 100, a drop-in fuel the FAA certified and authorized in March. It can be used in any tank or aircraft. The city says on Facebook and next door, the staff is working to get unleaded fuel and is in contact with GAMI, but the city does not provide the public with any concrete steps. Please verify if Livermore is in negotiations with GAMI distributors to receive G100UL. The timeline to transition to unleaded AV fuel must be accelerated. The council should consider the following steps. One, require the FBO to initiate a contract with G100UL distributors in California. The city will recoup $200,000 from Elevation LVK Cafe. Please consider using this money to buy an 8,500 gallon AV tank for G100UL. The benefits of offering unleaded fuel will reduce A, the lead poisoning of residents and B, allow piston aircraft to have a future at LVK. Please agendize updates on getting unleaded AV fuel for the next city council meeting. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Eli Robles, followed by Marty Sutton. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and community members. My name is Eli Robles, and I'm a union, union carpenter. I'm here tonight to implore upon you the need to insert language when projects come before you to include area standard wages as provided by our local unions. As long as, um, along with area standard wages, unions also provide apprenticeship programs that le let you earn while you learn a new trade. Also, as a union member, they will, they will be afforded benefits for themselves and family members thus not causing a burden on the on county and state governments. This along with local hire provisions will ensure that these hardworking folks are also part of our community and not sitting in traffic and adding to our commute and pollution. Unfortunately, on the other side of the coin, it only takes a short drive to notice the, div, uh, the biggest developers in town not offering area standard wages, training or benefits should they be injured on the job and really don't care where these workers come from as long as it is done fast and cheap. Not only are they cheating the workers, but also cheating the community. Since the community, uh, since the quality of the projects they leave in our neighborhoods will not be of the same quality if they are not being trained. In short, as a 23 year, uh, 23 year union member, through the ups and downs in the economy, I've been able to purchase my own home and provide for my family, working hard every day. So I, so I ask of you to help us build not just buildings, but also stronger communities for all of us uh, with these provisions. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Marty Sutton. Good evening. My name is Marty Sutton and I'm the board chair for Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance. Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance is proud that this month we are celebrating our 10 year anniversary. Founded in 2014, we are a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to provide advocacy, collaboration, and education to strengthen the nonprofit organizations enriching our communities. On March 14th, we hosted the mayor's panel with the five Tri-Valley mayors. Thank you to Mayor Marchand for participating in this panel and also for acknowledging Kathy Young, Moni Knopp, and Tri-Valley nonprofits 10 year anniversary. I also want to thank you, um, Vice Mayor Carling and Council Member Barrientos for also attending that event. We also have two big events coming up in May. Our first one is on May 2nd. The TVNPA will be hosting the Anti-Poverty Collaborative Forum on Housing in the Tri-Valley. This event is a free event and will be held at the Bankhead Theater from 10 to 12 in the morning and, is reg and, and you can register at tvnpa.org. Again, that is a free event and all members of the community are invited. On May 15th, we have our big event, which is Dan Pelota is screening his documentary titled Uncharitable. 
This thought-provoking documentary is directed by Steven, Stephen Gyllenhaal, sorry, and narrated by Dan Pelota. After the film, we will sit down with Dan and talk about a new approach to philanthropy. The screening of Uncharitable and Discussions isn't just for nonprofits. This event is for everyone that wants to have an impact in our community. The nonprofit sector has significant challenges that is, and there's an urgent need for change, not only in how we fund nonprofits, but also how we support our nonprofit employees. They all deserve a living wage and they should not be trying to work for free. If you wanna be a part of this dynamic and positive change in philanthropy, philanthropy, please join us on May 15th at the Bankhead Theater at 5 p.m. We have right now have an early bird pricing of 105 per person for TV and PA non-members and $85 for members. This pricing ends April 12th, and then after that, the prices will go up. We're asking everybody to, in the community to please attend this event. You can learn more about TVNPA and all of our um, community programs at tvnpa.org. Thank you. And I gave um, city council members invitations to all this. I hope you will. Thank you. I hope you will attend. This is so important. We need to support our providers, and we need to look at how we fund our nonprofits. We need to change how we do it. Thank you. And that concludes open forum. Very good, thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, consent calendar. These are items that are typically routine in nature and are usually uh, passed with a single vote. Um, well, so let me let me back up just a moment here. Um, so there was a question: uh, What's causing the uh, the delay in uh, uh, in leaded in the sale of unleaded fuel? Um, now they mentioned that the uh, the thirty day requirement or the sixty day requirement from uh, Bay Area Air Quality Management District could be could be waived, but they have not done that. Is that correct, Mr. Mayor? This is your City Manager, Mariana Marishva. Uh, no, they have not done that. We're still, as a matter of fact, waiting to hear back from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. We're checking almost daily, um, waiting for the final confirmation of the tank recertification as well as the appropriate uh, process. So we're waiting on them. Um, also, there was uh, um, the uh, uh, idea that the, the fuels, uh, it was almost, I misunderstood that the fuels were interchangeable, that there were fuels that could be used in unleaded, uh, uh, in planes that could burn unleaded or also you know, leaded. Uh, now the GAMI is the only one that's, uh, uh, that's interchangeable, the drop in replacement, but the, uh, uh, if a plane is required to use leaded fuel, it cannot burn unleaded fuel unless it has both the engine and the frame certified to uh, to, to run unleaded fuel. Uh, and that certification can run about $1,000. Uh, I had actually suggested to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District that if they wanted to incentivize pilots uh, to be able to burn unleaded fuel, uh, that they could perhaps provide grants to, uh, to the pilots so that they would be able to transition. Uh, unfortunately, we've heard nothing from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District uh, on that either, but this is a requirement of, from the Federal Aviation Administration. There's been a lot of talk back and forth between uh, the EPA uh, and some of the air quality uh, jurisdictions, uh, but they're not the ones that require the, the fuels. That's the FAA, and the FAA really needs to be brought into this discussion. Um, is the and I keep hearing about this four year old uh, that tested positive for lead. Uh, the Center for Environmental Health uh, has determined the number one cause of lead poisoning in children or lead, uh, the, the presence of lead in their blood. Uh, the number one cause is housing that was built before 1978 because of the lead paint in the home. Uh, the child's home uh, was built in 1968, uh, so it did use lead paint. Uh, so this is something that it, it's it's alarmist, and I think it's unfortunate that people are using uh, a child to to put forth their own agendas. Uh, we are moving as quickly as we can on this, uh, but uh, we all saw the uh, uh, article in the newspaper that there was a tremendous uh, contamination episode uh, dealing with uh, these ubiquitous um, applesauce uh, packs these little packets of applesauce uh, in the parts per million 
uh, and even parts per thousand of lead that was in the cinnamon. Uh, and we're looking at uh, lead in the drinking water in, in parts per billion. And it was you know, many orders of magnitude greater than that. Uh, so there's a lot of sources uh, for lead. Not, it's, it's not that simple. Uh, we are moving very quickly. Uh, I, I was, again, I'll ask the city manager, is this GAMI fuel currently available in the entire state of California? Mr. Mayor, to my knowledge, no, it is not. But as soon as it becomes available, we'll be ready to um, start have, purchasing it. We've got an airport uh, manager here. Uh, this is the airport manager, Benny Stuth. To answer your question, GAMI is not available commercially in California or anywhere for that matter. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. I just wanted to make that clear because this we keep hearing this over and over again uh, that everybody else is using this, um, but it is not available. So someday it will be, and when it is available, yeah. we'll be right there to get it, uh, but currently it is not available. And so thank you very much for the clarification. Um, okay, that's all I've got. Thank you. Um, now, back to the consent calendar. Does anybody wish to pull anything on consent for a discussion? Just, just one thing that I'd like to, uh, to mention uh, on 5.6, uh, that's okay. Uh, you don't need to, to comment on this. Uh, but on uh, page five points, uh, page two forty two, uh, item five point six, the legislative platform, um, they uh, uh, some of the items on there that are listed as very very important in our legislative platform uh, are the. Uh, uh, let me pull this up. Um, and that is the importance of. Uh, open space and uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, item number seven. Uh, so it's a support to promote uh, agriculture, open space preservation, historic preservation and good design. And so these are things that are very important. And what we do is when we do go back to Washington DC when we're working on the state level, uh, these are the uh, legislative uh, Things that we promote, so I think it's very important that this is this is something that's important to the city, and this is actually in our legislative platform that we uh, that we carried with us. In fact, next week I'll be going up to uh, the state uh, carrying this legislative platform platform as well. Uh, but again, open space preservation and historic preservation continue to be very important for this community. Uh, so, with that, um, do I have a, a motion for the consent calendar? And they ask for public comment. Oh, public comment. There's no public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I knew that. <laughs> um, okay, uh, there being no public comment, I'm going to close the public comment period uh, and uh, bring it back to the council. Is there a motion for the consent calendar? So moved. Uh, moved by Councilmember Branning, seconded by Councilmember uh, Kick. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, on to. Uh, uh, public hearings, uh, item 6.1. Uh, this is a hearing to consider the housing element annual progress report, tracking the city's progress toward implementing the housing uh, element of the general plan. Honorable Mayor Marshall and members of the city council, this is your city manager, Mariana Marasheva. Item 6.1 is going to be presented by Shannon Pagan, assistant planner, uh, with the assistance of uh, Steve Riley, acting uh, planning manager. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, good evening, Mayor Marchand and members of the City Council. Again, my name is Shannon Pagan, Assistant Planner, and tonight I will be presenting the 2023 Housing Element Annual Progress Report. This report is prepared annually and represents a compilation of data tracking the city's progress, meeting the goals and objectives of the housing element. Livermore's updated housing element was adopted by the City Council and certified in March of 2023. Uh, so this report represents the first year implementing the updated housing element. Uh, the preparation and filing of the annual progress report is re required by state law and maintains the city's eligibility for various funding and uh, housing grant programs. So it's a really important report that we do each year um, and it is due to the state uh, by April 1st. So if you accept the report this evening, we will uh, be filing it and submitting it to the state by the April 1st deadline. 
The state's reporting requirements have increased considerably over the last several years and are continuing to expand. Uh, the primary fo focus historically uh, has been on reporting the number of building permits issued by income level, as well as reporting progress implementing our housing programs. Uh, over the last five years, the state has requested um, more detail and added additional reporting requirements to get a more comprehensive picture of housing applications as they move through uh, the entitlement process. Uh, while it's a considerable effort for local jurisdictions uh, to complete this report, it is very impressive to see the data come together each year and uh, serves as a really good indicator of the progress that we are making to implement our housing element. With the adoption of our updated housing element in 2023, began a new regional housing needs allocation cycle or the RENA as we call it. Um, we are now in the sixth cycle RENA, which spans an eight year period corresponding with our housing element ending in 2031. The RENA provides housing targets uh, by income level as shown in this last column here. You can see um, it broken down by, by income level. And uh, we see that Livermore's RENA targets include accommodating um, 4,570 4, units by the end of 2031. So this table shows us our progress in this first year of the sixth RENA cycle. Uh, before we get too deep into this table, uh, just a quick reminder that uh, units are counted towards the RENA uh, at the time building permits are issued. Um, so this table again shows our cumulative contributions for the sixth cycle, which includes units that were issued a building permit in the projection period between the fifth and sixth cycles, as well as the 2023 APR reporting period. Uh, the number of building permits issued in 2023 was lower than we've seen in the last two APR reporting periods, and again, lower in the years prior to 2020, um, likely a result of current market conditions uh, here in the Tri-Valley and larger Bay Area. Um, increasing construction costs, as well as ongoing litigation of approved residential projects here in the city. Another quick note on this table before we move on, um, you can see that we did not issue any building permits for the very low and low income categories. Um, we didn't, the projects that we issued building permits did not include those type of units this year. Um, in general, meeting the, um, the targets for these type of units in the category in this category is difficult due to the high public su uh, subsidies that are necessary to fund these types of units. Um, however, in the in the near future, we do expect to see some contributions not only to these lower income uh, categories, but across the board in all of our income categories, as uh, there are multiple residential projects that are undergoing review and even some starting construction that will contribute to this table in the um, very near future. I will highlight a few of those projects in a couple slides. Um, before I get to those, I just wanted to touch on our uh, housing programs progress. Uh, tw again, 2023 was the first year implementing our updated housing elements. So many of the, prog uh, the programs are new and the progress is ongoing. Um, but of note, the city continues to make progress implementing our inclusionary ordinance, uh, requiring 10 to 20% of affordable units, depending on the location in the city. In 2023, we executed several low-income housing agreements securing over 90 affordable units in the low and moderate income categories for buyers in the future. So we'll be really excited to see those units reflected in our arena numbers uh, when the building permits are issued for those projects. Uh, we also continue to encourage ADUs in the city. And in fact, 70% of the building permits that we issued in 2023 were for ADUs. Uh, we continue to expect that they will make up a significant portion of the units that are um, issued building permits each year due to state streamlining provisions. In addition to that, 
We continue to make progress implementing a variety of housing assistance programs, uh, including funding local nonprofits and homelessness programs, as well as identifying other opportunities for creating affordable units by leveraging our local housing trust funds. So as I mentioned a moment ago, um, the APR not only requires us to report on the building permits issued, but also includes status on projects as they move through the entitlement process. So I wanted to take a few slides to go over several residential projects currently moving through the approval process. And um, while these slides are not a comprehensive list of all the residential project applications, uh, they do provide a snapshot of some of the projects that are in the pipeline. Um, we do expect to see these units contribute to the implementation of our housing programs um, and be reflected in our arena allocations over the next several years. Again, when the building permits are issued for the projects. So first we have the Arroyo Vista development in the Arroyo Vista neighborhood plan off of Las Positas. Um, this project includes uh, 435 approved units. Uh, this was entitled back in 2017, but it's on the move again. Um, it includes 52 affordable units, both in the moderate and low income categories. And we expect uh, construction to begin in the summer of 2024 on this project. The next few slides are dedicated to some projects in the Isabel neighborhood specific plan. Uh, this is an area in the city where we expect to see a bulk of the permit uh, building permit activity in the coming years, as was the intent of the INSP when it was adopted. Um, this area can accommodate the types of residential densities that are needed to help us meet our arena allocations. Um, <clears throat> and they do so in a way that's less impactful to our established single family neighborhoods while being compatible with the types of existing residential densities that are currently on the ground in the INSP area. Another important note, um, all these projects that I'm going to highlight will meet the INSP inclusionary ordinance uh, requirements for affordable units, um, with the majority of them falling into the, the moderate income category, but um, they will also contribute to the very low and low income categories. So this first one highlights a uh, triad east and west. This is, these are located on North Canyon Parkway um, on east and west of Triad Drive. Uh, triad West is under construction and Triad East is approved. Uh, both of these include moderate um, unit, uh, affordable units in the moderate category. Uh, next we have the Shade 2B condominiums and apartment projects. Uh, these are located north of Portola Avenue and Collier Canyon Road. Um, Shade 2B condominiums are um, under construction, and the Shade 2B apartments have an improved a title, entitlement. Um, however, they are undergoing further development review as they are proposing a unit increase. Um, it's important to note that the Shade 2B apartments include uh, units in the low, the very low and low income categories. Lastly, to highlight in the INSP, we have the Shea 2A Aura project and the Heritage Development. These are south of Portola Avenue on the east and west side of Isabel Avenue. Um, uh, Heritage is another project that will provide a pretty substantial number of the very low and low income units with this project. So the big takeaway uh, there here is that uh, there are a lot of current development applications for projects in the INSP that will collectively propose uh, over nearly uh, 2,500 units at completion and will provide contributions to all income categories in the arena at the time building permits are issued. And just a few more, uh, we have um, uh, just a couple more that are, are included in the 2023 APR. Uh, this quickly of note, we have the Pacific Avenue development right across the street from City Hall here in the old Knob Hill Center, as well as the Church Street Apartments just outside of the downtown core. And to bring it home, we have the approved assisted living at the well on uh, Holmes and Concannon. That one offers 84 assisted living units that would also contribute to the arena. And finally, our Vineyard 2.0, which completed construction at the end of December 2023 with a soft opening 
and is now fully open and occupied, uh, providing per permanent supportive housing and supportive services to very low income residents here in the city. So um, I think with that, I'll put a pin in all of that. And uh, overall, we have um, lots of housing activity underway and on the horizon and enough to keep us busy for next year's APR. Um, in closing, staff recommends the City Council adopt a resolution accepting the 2023 Housing Element Annual Progress Report and staff is available for questions. There, thank you very much. Um, questions from the council? Vice Mayor? Yeah, so thanks for the report on the Arroyo Vista. Um, if I'm doing my math, 52 is not uh, the right, is not at least 15%. It's uh, less than that. So are they making up for it with an in-lieu fee? I think that needs to be clear to the people. Yes, uh, Councilmember Carling, they are making up with an in-lieu fee that was done through a development agreement in 2017. Okay, I just want to be clear, because if you look at the rest of them, I think they're all 20% or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And then um, in that staff report, you said that uh, for sale, the requirement is 15%. Uh, and is it half of that supposed to be low? I, did, I missed, I didn't quite understand the wording in the staff report whether or not half mm -hmm. needs to be a low and ultra very low? Yes, I think it's a 7.5%. Okay, so it's not 7.5% mm -hmm. of 15, it's 7.5% of the total. Yes, thank you. Yes. It, so this is Paul Spencer, Assistant City Manager. It varies by district in Livermore. So most of the city is 15% and includes a 7.5% low and very low. In the Isabel neighborhood, uh, the for sale units are median and moderate, and the apartment units include the low and very low. So it, right. it varies a bit by district. Sure. Okay. I just wanted clarity uh, around the uh, staff report. Thank you. Just questions. Um, I'm not great at math, but I'm, so call me out if I'm wrong. 2023, uh, 2031 is about eight years, correct? I think that math is not that hard. Um, uh, our goal for our remaining arena is 4,448. If we were to just do raw numbers, we should be looking at approving over 550 units a year to be on track. We're at 122. I don't think that's a reflection of staff. Um, I think it's a reflection of how difficult this is. Uh, do you know in relation to our neighbors, if we are um, considered on track? Um, technically, no, S straight numbers, we're not on track. However, relatively, can you discuss how we're doing um, in the Tri-Valley? So for the city of Livermore, as Shannon emphasized, we are a little bit behind the average that we need to be. But again, we do have a lot in the pipeline. And besides the ISP, we have some other projects that she did not highlight. Um, and also with the ISP, she'd mentioned the projects that are just in progress are the 2,500. There's other ISP areas that have not even applied for um, uh, entitlements yet. So the ISP, as you know, is planned for 35 to 4,000 units just on its own. So we think that's going to contribute significantly to meeting our arena goal for 2023 to 2031. I don't have information on some of our neighboring cities. We do know from our experience that all the cities have a, a difficult time being the low and very low income numbers because, again, of the the large public subsidies needed for those projects. So we're sort of in line with a lot of our neighbors when it comes to the low and very low, and we, we do our best to meet that uh, as we move forward. Um, I, I haven't seen the other cities, but I do believe in other years we have been ahead, if not um, one of the top. I just did want to point out that if you're just looking at straight math, I get that this might seem uh, below average. However, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, these numbers, I believe, are just a testament to how difficult it is to get these projects off the ground. Um, 
even when there are no extra unnecessary barriers. So um, that was that was my only clarification there. And um, I think you answered my my question that we do have some different um, rules in the INSP about what's a rental and what's not. Um, I see uh, not as many rental units as I was would generally like because um, we know that a lot of people can't afford to buy homes, but I think um, the Isabel Neighborhood Plan is going to really support um, with those rental units. So thank you for the update. You might mention what INSP stands for. I'm not sure everybody in this room knows what that stands for. Sorry about that. It's the Isabel Neighborhood Specific Plan Area. Thank you. Good call. -out. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, just a small question for my education, uh, and I have some comments for later. Uh, but when we talk about uh, affordable, low income, very low income housing, it has to be subsidized housing, correct? If we do building by design, say an ADU that is renting for a lower price because it has a squ smaller uh, square footage, that would not count still for affordable, uh, any of the affordable categories. Is that correct? The typically ADUs are recorded in the moderate category. Um, they do not uh, account go in the low income, but they are moderate and they are, we assume that they are rentals and um, belong in that category, rented for moderate prices. Okay, but if it, you know any small mm -hmm. footprint apartment, if there wasn't a subsidy, it would count as either the moderate or uh, market rate, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, on the Pacific Avenue one, uh, that's been approved for many years now, right? The, the building of what are they going to build there? Because one of the things I have invested in is my life, so we meet at Mill Villas and been hearing rumors for years now that the developer is going to go and do something there. So everybody's bailing out now. So can you give me an idea? I kind of, this is a rhetorical question, but what's, why are these developers taking such a long time to build and get going at construction? So the project actually has not been approved yet. We've had discussions on and off, and the developer has spoken to us and then uh, kind of cooled their jets for a while. They are very actively uh, in process right now, and we are in the midst of reviewing their application. We expect to bring it forward to Planning Commission and City Council later this year, so uh, you will see a project there. The current project does not include any commercial uses, uh, but we have heard Anecdotally, that Emil Villas and some of the other tenants there are looking at other spaces in the city for relocation. Okay, with that, I'm going to open up the uh, uh, public hearing. Do we have any speakers? No public comment. Okay, in that case, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, question Now, the city does not build housing, uh, we rely on the market to build housing, and uh, we also require um, partners, and uh, some of these uh, low and extremely low require significant subsidies, and that's why we're, we're not where we would like to be, because the market and the subsidies just are not there. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so it's not because we're not trying. Right. It's just that the market's not building it and we don't have the subsidies in place. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Branning. Yeah, I just have a comment from, uh, I was at the Cal City's Housing and Economic Development Policy Committee. So it's a very, very long name. Uh, and one of the things that was brought up was actually about the uh, annual progress report that we should be monitoring. Legislation is currently going through that would add in punitive measures if we're not meeting certain milestones. It shouldn't affect this year, but if the legislation passes, it might affect future years. It's not just gonna be where we currently are that we might lose out on some grant funding, but some of the proposed legislation would reopen us up to builders remedy applications, things like that. So I just wanted to inform staff of those developments and to make sure we're following that legislation closely. So those punitive measures will likely impact most cities because, as we discussed earlier, most cities have a very hard time meeting those very low and low-income categories. 
which are the things targeted through the legislation. So it's it's set up to catch almost all of the cities. Yeah, it's very punitive how they're setting it up currently. Uh, I know in our ledge platform, we are looking to make sure we have you know control over how our city is built. And uh, this legislation will be very damaging, I believe, if it passes, not just to our city, but to, as you said, almost every city, the milestones are virtually impossible to reach. Unless you're in Marin County, and then it's, then you get a pass. Yep. <laughs> so, okay, uh, with that, uh, and it's not like we aren't trying. I mean, we six years ago, we passed an affordable housing project, uh, 130 apartments, and we're still battling in court on that one. So uh, uh, it's not for lack of trying, but uh, uh, just the market. Uh, okay, any other uh, questions or comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion. A motion made by uh, Councilmember Kick. Second. Worth second? Okay, seconded by Councilmember by, by Vice Mayor Carling. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to uh, uh, 6.2, and this is a resolution authorizing and approving and adopting an amended permanent local housing allocation program, five year plan to reallocate funds. 6.2. Yes, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, this is once again your City Manager, Mariana Marasheva, and uh, 6.2 is going to be presented by Natalia Jelina in the Housing and Human Services Division with the assistance of Fran Reisner, our Housing and Human Services Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Give us just a second to load the presentation. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, thank you, Mariana, for introduction. Today for your consideration is the approval of uh, an amendment um, to the city's 2019-2023 PLHA permanent local housing allocation plan. The city is an entitlement recipient of permanent local housing allocation funds from the state of California housing um, community development the total estimated award for the uh, five-year plan is one million, one million two hundred fifty-one thousand two hundred forty dollars. The PLHA program provides communities uh, with direct assistance to increase the local housing stock through a wide range of eligible activities uh, for extremely low to moderate income households. The city is required to adopt and maintain a five-year plan. With, uh, with eligible activities um, that, that are funded by the PLHA dollars. On November 14, uh, 2022, the City Council amended, uh, adopted an amended PLHA plan um, that included uh, two, um, two, two activities for 2019 and 2020 allocations. These programs were shared housing rehabilitation for extremely low income individuals with developmental disabilities and Vineyard 2.0 housing navigation and operating subsidies. Uh, per PLHA uh, state guidelines, uh, public hearing is required to consider an adoption of the amendment of the city's plan. Uh, following the previous adopted plan, the city partnered with Tri Valley Reach to assist uh, with funding for two rehabilitation projects that supply supportive shared housing uh, for extremely low um, income tenants with individual and developmental disabilities. The city council approved low interest loans for those properties, which were funded through the 2019 PLHA allocation. The scope of rehabilitation included expansion of bedroom spaces to accommodate additional tenants, structural improvements, interior renovation, landscaping design, and accessibility improvements. The Colgate Shared Housing Project was completed in 2023, and the project located in Camden Common was open its doors to four new residents 
on February 14, 2024. The city expanded the full amount of $208,540 of its 2019 PLHA allocation for this project. The city had allocated 2020 PLHA funding for this project. However, there were no uh, additional projects identified. Therefore, the 2020 PLHA funds need to be reprogrammed to other activities. This table here summarizes the current PLHA plan allocations. As previously mentioned, um, $208,540 in 2019 funding has been expanded on the shared housing rehabilitation program. However, 2020 funding for this program is no longer needed. If shared housing rehabilitation needs present in the future, the staff will identify other sources to address those funding needs. Therefore, staff recommends reprogramming $307,930 in 2020 PLHA funding to other activities supporting vineyard and homeless services. For the PLHA amended plan, staff recommends to reallocate funds in years 2020 and beyond to activities that assist persons who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness per PLHA guidelines, specifically housing navigation, rental assistance, and expanded overnight shelter operations at Vineyard, designate future 2022-2023 PLHA application funds to the state for those activities. The 2020-2023 amended plan proposed activities would provide funding to Housing Consortium of the East Bay, HCEB, Open Heart Kitchen Refuge Overnight Shelter Program at Vineyard Resource Center, and Rental Assistance for City Serve to address the needs of the unhoused community members. A brief overview of the proposed activities. The construction of the Vineyard 2.0 was finished in December 2023, and the Vineyard Resource Center opened its doors on January 22, 2024. In addition to 23 units of permanent housing for extremely low income households, the Vineyard Resource Center provides a multitude of services to address the homeless individuals in crisis, including 20 bed overnight refuge shelter operated by the Open Heart Refuge Program. The reprogrammed 2020 PLHA funding allocation will allow the 20 bed shelter to sustain operations seven days a week, providing overnight shelter refuge for persons from inclement weather, along with breakfast and dinner through open heart kitchen, daily showers, laundry services, and access to housing navigation. Following state requirements, staff recommends City Council adopt two resolutions authorizing the following authorizing, approving, and adopting an amended permanent local housing allocation plan for 2019-2023, authorizing the city manager to execute the PLHA program application for the 2023 PLHA notice of funding availability, which was released on December 29 of 2023, authorizing the city manager to accept and appropriate the allocations for the amended PLHA plan and authorizing the city manager to sign all documents related to the execution of grant agreements with sovereignties. Thank you for your time and consideration, and the staff is open for questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay, um, I'm going to open the public hearing. Are there any uh, comments? Yes, sir. The first speaker is Margaret Ann Fortner. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Margaret Ann Fortner. I'm the Senior Program Manager of Crisis Stabilization at, the, at City Serve of the Tri-Valley. I want to thank the Council for their support in providing human, providing the needs, uh, the funding needed to support those in need in our community. Um, City Serve of the Tri-Valley has had the honor of partnering with the City of Livermore for several years, and we've seen lives change. In the last four years, over 100 unsheltered participants in our program have become housed. 
<clears throat> sorry. <laughs> Over 100, per, 100 unsheltered participants have become housed, and every little bit of subsidy funding to help those individuals helps them move out of crisis and start to stabilize. They each work with an individual on a care plan, and it can take a year, it could take three months. It's all individualized to the person that we're serving. Um, I um, have seen many people walk through and they've been living in a um, in one of our encampments and they've faced addiction and many different issues. I've seen moms that have escaped domestic violence with their children and those deposit funds are and rental assistance funds are vital. So I would ask you to go ahead and approve the amended um, request that's before you. And I just thank you for partnering with us to do the work to serve our community. Thank you. The next speaker is Carl Winty. Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, thank you all for what you do. Speaking on item 6.2 and staying on topic, but before I do, just want to say thank you. Those put on bulletproof vests, go to work, keep us safe. Any in the badges here make work. Those that run for elected office, why do you do it? Y'all crazy, but someone needs to in this. The staff, as it flows, it's an imperfect system, doing the best that we can to move it forward for the benefit of our society. Salute those that look after the most uh, destitute and uh, the, the people that are in most need. Uh, quote Mother Teresa, uh, doesn't feel like a drop in the bucket. No, it feels like a drop in the ocean because you can never do enough, um, but fundamentally we want to do everything we can and put money to work. The uh, tribe, uh, Nonprofit Alliance, I forget the acronym, uh, Nonprofit Alliance, what well, great organization. Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, who is just up here, um, the work that you do is awesome. I would love to say, take every advantage of just educating us citizens that don't know much about all of this in terms of the three letter acronyms and I'm furiously looking up and what's there. PLHA, we got that, NOFA, Got that after circling back. Rena, Rena comes from a state law, I believe. I'm not sure. How does that play in against that one? Rena, is it about entitlements or? But the progress is about building permits. And does that one slide can educate the public? And this is an open government. An open government implies that we're speaking the same language, but in fact we're not because we're not. We as a citizenry don't have. We're not studying as much and reading into it. So just help us. Help everyone that's listening know what all of this means. Because it matters, right? It matters greatly. Um, Greg Scott's not here. And we're talking about housing and homelessness in the, the book that uh, Mr. Carling, you and I both read, I think others have as well, of homelessness is a housing problem. And he said, well, he doesn't like that title because it's a structural problem. It's much more than that. But fundamentally, heads and beds, having rooms, having a place, having a safe place works. And he said, decommodify the housing market which means that the free market is not building affordable. And even with all the work that you're doing, trying to push it forward, the great work of staff, it still doesn't happen. The free market is not driving it forward. And that's what we're trying, right? Because it takes a little bit of social dollars to get this done. The free market's not doing it. So you got to keep pushing that stone up the hill, the Sisyphean roll on up, because incrementally it makes a difference. I think the second major point that I never heard Greg Scott talk about as it relates to the book, which is on homelessness and uh, on the funds going to this subject was shelters work, shelters work, right? To give people a place when they're in the most crisis, shelters work. In every case study throughout that book, it works. So continuing the great work of, uh, I'm pointing behind me, but just I heard you speak and what you do to give people an opportunity in crisis to step out of that crisis to a safe spot. Shelters work. Our affordable housing system is not perfect. Keep pushing that stone up the hill. Thank you so much. Cheers. Namaste. And that concludes public comment. And it's Tri Valley Nonprofit Alliance, TVNPA. <laughs> okay, with that, I'm going to close the uh, public comment period, bring it back to the council. Um, questions or comments from the council? By council Member Branning. Thank you. Uh, you know, as always, I could spend half an hour talking about all of the great stuff in this. I very much appreciate the work you put into here. Uh, I have a few just general things uh, I wanted to check in on. 
So I wanted to say, first of all, that I really appreciate the work that Tri-Valley Reach has done, the rehabilitation of the homes. Uh, I believe, just to clarify, the reason that they did not get the funding in 2020 is they just simply couldn't find a property to rehabilitate. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's unfortunate. Uh, that said- That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that said, the funding that we're getting, it's uh, a little over a million dollars over five years. This is entirely grant funding, so it's not uh, city funds, general funds going to this. I think it's a really good return we have on our investment with Vineyard 2.0. That comes out to about roughly with the remainder of the term, around $1,000 per bed per month. Uh, that is a pretty good deal in my book. It's you know not perfect, but we are getting heads in beds, as they say, for $1,000 uh, per bed per month. To Ms. Sutton's point earlier, you know, part of this is paying for staff, paying for services. Vineyard 2.0 has a great model where you're allowed to stay in a shelter bed for multiple days. You don't have to leave and I'll try to get back in line and work to get another spot. They have services to try to find permanent supportive housing uh, or just permanent unsupported housing for people who are uh, able. Uh, and I really just want to thank everything that Ms. Uh, Fortner does and everyone at Vineyard 2.0. I think this is money super well spent. I think this is really effective uh, and meaningful use for the funds. And to Mr. Wente's point, it may be a drop in the ocean, but for the 20 people who are sleeping there at night, it can be life-changing. So thank you. Any comments? Oh, uh, Councilor Rekic. Yeah, I just want to get a couple um, clarification points. So it is 2024. We are reallocating funding from 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023, correct? Uh, thank you for asking. We're reallocating 2020 funding. Only 2020 funding? Yes. The, just the yellow. OK. Um, uh, Mr. Wente left, but I was about to give him some education. Um, so uh, nonprofits like CityServe don't just uh, get checks from the state. They depend on city contracts. And those city contracts are extremely important when they are allocating their funding. It's important for organizations like this to have uh, fund diversification so that if they don't get that city contract, they can still help people out. I'm concerned that 2020 funding is just being reallocated in 2024, that that city contract that we are now giving um, could have gone to good use elsewhere. I get um, it's it's really difficult and we are, we are looking at kind of changing um, how we are allocating funding in our human services um, commission and I know get changing CDG, uh, these are CDG, HDD funds is difficult. Um, but it's, uh, I can't wait to see where we are always spending every dollar we have the year we get it. Um, on a second note, the Colgate rehab project is actually uh, my neighbor right across the street. And so I got to watch that get done. And it wasn't just, let's make the front yard pretty. Um, it is, making that front yard useful because multiple of the residents have mobility devices and now they can get to the, uh, what is it? When it's the dial a ride service that comes multiple times a day, every day, very easily and to the driveway and the trash cans and all the other things they need to do. So um, projects like that um, are also pretty awesome. So thank you um, for this work. And I look forward to passing this uh, funding along so that it can help people in need. Thank you. Okay, very good, thank you. Any comments? Okay. Uh, I'd like to recognize John Bost from uh, Open Heart Kitchen here tonight uh, and to commend the great success uh, the Vineyard 2.0 has become. Uh, in the first month, they served thousands of meals uh, to hundreds of individual uh, guests. Uh, and provided hundreds of uh, laundry uh, service uh, applications and uh, just and mail service, all of the things that, that we all take for granted, but are critically important if you're going to have a hand up for people so that they can lift themselves up and eventually uh, be self-sustaining. So thank you for the great work that you're doing. And 
um, and all the great work that, that everybody's coming together to, uh, we, we so depend upon our nonprofits uh, to do the heavy lifting on this. So thank you all very much for the great work that you do. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. All right. Sure. Uh, okay. So uh, with that, I'd be willing to recommend uh, to uh, uh, take a uh, uh, motion. I will move staff recommendation. I'll second. I'll, I'll give that one to, to Ben. Ben, uh, she, he had his hand raised. So motion made by Councilmember Branding, seconded by uh, Councilmember Barrientos. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, and now moving on to the main event. Um, by the way, I just have to tell you folks, uh, just to underscore how hard the staff works, uh, the packet tonight was 2,690 pages. The uh, uh, just item 6.3 was 2,340 pages long. There's a tremendous amount of work that went into this. We have Ashley Vera tonight uh, who's going to be presenting. Uh, but all together, including the 270 pages of supplemental material, uh, the me members of the council up here went through 2,960 pages that our staff put together uh, so that we can come together and make the best decisions that we can. We get the best information so we can make the de best decisions. Uh, and that's part of the commitment that, that we have. So when I talk to uh, elementary kids, I tell them, if you want to do this job, read. Yeah, love reading because it's something that's going to be absolutely critically important. So uh, with that, I'll hand it off to the staff that did a tremendous heavy lift on this one. So thank you. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, you introduced the speaker already. Thank you. But I wanted to echo your praise to staff and uh, thank our team, including Ashley Vera, as well as many other staff members for the incredible work on this item. And also wanted to thank our mayor and city council for paying attention and reading uh, 2,000 plus pages of documents that we prepared for you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley Vera. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. All right, so tonight I will be presenting the SMP or Surface Mining Permit 39 and 40 project. So the project is surrounded by the Livermore Municipal Airport to the north, Isabel Avenue and State Route 84 to the east, Stanley Boulevard to the south, and El Charro Road to the west. The project includes SMP 39, SMP 40, and four additional uh, parcels shown here in the pink polygons. The SMP numbers are related to mining permits for the two SMP sites shown on this map. These permits were approved by Alameda County in 2004 to allow for the extraction of sand and gravel. However, aggregate mining has not occurred within these sites. Each of these properties is located within Alameda County, and they are also within the city of Livermore's urban growth boundary. SMP 39 is within the City of Pleasanton's Sphere of Influence, or SOI. The project includes amending the SOI boundary to include SMP 39 in the City of Livermore's SOI. In addition, SMP 39 would be annexed or made a part of the city limits. Finally, the proposal for SMP 39 includes light industrial development. The City of Pleasanton City Council voted to support the SOI amendment an annexation at their March 19th City Council meeting. A letter of support from the City of Pleasanton has been provided in the supplemental packet. SMP 40 is within the City of Livermore's SOI, but located outside of the city's limits. The project includes annexing SMP 40 into the city and developing the property with light industrial uses similar to those proposed for SMP 39. The pink area shown here represents uh, four additional parcels that are currently within the city's sphere of influence, but they are located outside of the city's limits. The city has requested that these parcels be annexed into the city to create a logical boundary to the city limit line. Development is not proposed on these four additional parcels. The project consists of the entitlements and actions shown on this slide. It should be noted that there is only one site plan design review or SPDR proposed for the project tonight. This SPDR is specific to the SMP 40 property. 
The developer would like to develop the S&P 40 property first and return in the future with an SPDR for the S&P 39 property in the future. The future SPDR for the S&P 39 property would be subject to planning commission review and approval. In addition, the project is subject to review and approval by the Alameda County Local Agency Formation Commission, or LAFCO. The project requires LAFCO's review and approval due to the SOI amendment and annexation requests. If the project is approved, staff would submit an application to the Alameda County LAFCO for their review. This is the preliminary site plan for the SMP 39 property. The project includes a vesting tentative map to subdivide the existing parcel into six lots. The proposal includes developing the site with approximately 755,000 square feet of light industrial development. Examples of light industrial development include research and development facilities, professional administrative offices, experimental and um, testing laboratories, manufacturing and warehouse and distribution facilities. Access to the site would be from West Jack London Boulevard. This is the proposed site plan for the SMP 40 property. The proposal includes a vesting tentative parcel map to divide the property into two parcels with one building on each parcel. The proposal includes approximately 759,000 square feet of light industrial development similar to the uses proposed for the SMP 39 property. Access to the site would be from Atlantis and Challenger site uh, streets, which are existing streets north of the property. It should be noted that the site plan incorporates noise reducing design features, particularly through screening walls and landscaped berms to reduce noise impacts to residences located further to the east. The developer has signed a lease agreement with LAM Research for the Western building an approximately 470,000 square foot building. Lamb Research is a local business with manufacturing facilities located in the Isabel neighborhood. This development would allow Lamb Research to expand in Livermore by providing a location for their supply chain and logistics operations. This architectural rendering is for the Western building on the SMP 40 property. The buildings on the property consist of concrete tilt-up panels, with aluminum storefront framing and tempered glass at the building entrances and office areas. The buildings would be approximately 47 feet in height. Building colors proposed for the buildings consist of primarily off-white, gray, and blue tones. These design details are consistent with the nearby Oaks Business Park development, as well as the city's design standards and guidelines. This is a rendering of the building now on the east side of the SMP 40 property. And as you can see, the architecture is very similar to that of um, the property adjacent to it. The proposed plan development zoning for both SMP 39 and SMP 40 will allow some typical light industrial uses such as those listed on this slide. It should be noted that warehouse and distribution uses are permitted on SMP 40 but they are conditionally permitted on the S&P 39 property. In addition, warehouse and distribution uses are limited to a 30, excuse me, 20% of the buildable site area on the S&P 39 site. This creates an opportunity for uses specifically at the S&P 39 property that are economic, economically desirable and uh, higher wage uh, gener or higher job generating uses. The project includes on and off-site trail improvements. The on-site trail consists of a paved at-grade trail shown here in the dashed green line. This trail is consistent with the uh, city's active transportation plan. This new on-site trail would connect to an existing uh, trail that is just west of the Oaks Business Park shown here in purple and make further connections further west to the San Francisco Premium Outlets. In addition, the project includes an off-site trail connection. Three trail connection options were evaluated as part of the project analysis. The off-site trail improvements uh, label here represents staff's preferred alternative or trail connection option. This option would connect to the existing Arroyo bike trail shown here in the solid purple line on the east side of Isabel Avenue and cross Isabel Avenue State Route 84 via a bridge. 
Once on the west side of Isabel, the offsite trail improvement would connect northward towards that new uh, onsite trail on the SP 40 property. The project includes a development agreement for SP 39 and SP 40. Per these development agreements, the developer is required to provide a $100,000 contribution towards marketing SP 39 towards the desired uses in the new zoning district for these properties. This contribution will go to the city's Office of Innovation and Economic Development Department. In addition, the developer is required to construct and provide a $750,000 contribution towards the offsite trail improvements. It should be noted that the offsite trail is estimated to cost approximately $2.5 million. The remainder of the trail cost will be funded through grant funding or the city will credit the developer using traffic impact fees, less the developer's contribution. Finally, the development agreements, as well as the conditions of approval, require that the property owner, owner forfeit the mining rights that are currently granted to these properties by Alameda County. It should be noted that if the SMP uh, sites are not developed, then mining activity could occur on these sites consistent with the permits granted by Alameda County. An environmental impact report or EIR was prepared for the project. The EIR analyzed resource topics shown on this slide. Each of these topics are discussed in a separate chapter of the EIR, including a description of the existing environmental setting, the regulatory setting, and the impacts that would result from the project. A summary of the impacts uh, found in the EIR is listed here. A majority of these impacts would be mitigated to a less than significant level. However, one impact was determined to be significant unavoidable. This impact is related to agricultural resources, specifically the conversion of farmland to non-agricultural uses. While SMP 39 and SMP 40 are not considered farmland pursuant to the Department of Cons Conservation, the sphere of influence amendment and the annexation is subject to LAFCO review and approval. Therefore, the project was reviewed against LAFCO's policies related to farmland. Per LAFCO policy, SMP 39 and SMP 40 are considered prime farmland, and the conversion of this land to industrial uses would be considered significant unavoidable. It should be noted that these sites are not used for farming operations as the sites have gone fallow and are currently dist. In addition, the sites are not under a Williamson Act contract. <clears throat> When there is a significant unavoidable impact, CEQA requires decision makers to balance the benefits of the project against its unavoidable environmental impacts. Approval of the project would revitalize underutilized lands that are appropriate for infill development and that is consistent with surrounding development. It would also promote industrial development that is consistent with our general plan and would provide jobs with competitive salaries and provide necessary on and off site improvements to the roadway system. The project would also create logical boundaries that align with the city's urban growth boundary, as well as, uh, as, well as improvements to the on and off site uh, trail system. Finally, the project would generate long-term sustainable property and sales tax revenues. The project was presented to various commissions and the Pleasanton City Council. Uh, firstly, since the project requires a general plan amendment, it is subject to the review of the Alameda County Airport Land Use Commission. The project proposes light industrial development, which is a compatible land use regarding noise, height and flight clearance, as well as public safety as described in the Alameda County Airport Land Use Conduct Compatibility Plan or ALUCP. The Alameda County Airport Land Use Commission reviewed the project and determined that it is compatible with the ALUCP. The City of Livermore's Airport Commission also reviewed the project and found the project compatible with the Livermore Airport Protection Area as well as the ALUCP with the condition that navigation easements be required for the properties. This has been made a condition of approval for the project. The Planning Commission reviewed the project earlier this month and unanimously recommended approval of the project with conditions that minor modifications be made to the on-site trail, the transportation demand management program requirements, as well as landscaping. 
These conditions have all been revised following the Planning Commission meeting and are in the conditions of approval for the project. Finally, as I noted earlier, the City of Pleasanton, Pleasanton City Council voted to support the sphere of influence boundary amendment and annexation at their March 19th City Council meeting. If the City Council approves the project, an application to LAFCO will be submitted on behalf of the city. LAFCO is a state-mandated local agency that oversees boundary changes to cities and special districts, such as the sphere of influence and annexation uh, requests for this project. It is anticipated that uh, staff would attend uh, LAFCO uh, later this spring or summer of this year. In conclusion, planning staff and, uh, excuse me, planning commission and staff recommend that the city council take the following actions, including adopting a resolution certifying the EIR and associated CEQA documents, adopt a resolution approving the general plan amendment, the subdivision maps, and the site plan design review, introduce an ordinance related to the plan development zoning, zoning map amendment, and development code amendment, introduce two ordinances authorizing execution of the DAs, uh, respectively for SMP 39 and SMP 40, and adopting a resolution authorizing staff to submit an application to LAFCO. This concludes staff's presentation. Staff is available for questions. I will also note that the applicant is here today as well and would like to uh, present a brief presentation for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Admiral. Everyone hear me okay? Uh, good, yeah. good evening, Mayor Michon and uh, Livermore City Council members. Uh, my name is Timor Tessimer. I'm managing partner of Overton Moore Properties. Um, when we started on this project back in 2019, I didn't think we'd get to, I think, 2,370 pages. So it, it's it's been quite a project. And factoring my career, uh, this project would be a fantastic case study uh, for some real estate students to really uh, see how urban planning, economic development, and collaboration between a developer and the city work. And, and again, commend uh, Ashley Vera for everything that she's done on the project. Um, a brief over, uh, overview of our company. Uh, we've been in business since 1972. Uh, we are one of the most active private developers uh, in Northern California. In fact, a few years ago, we were named Developer of the Year for a project in, uh, in Fremont, California. Um, I'm going to make a brief presentation because I know you've uh, reviewed um, all the information. Um, we have all of our consultants here and the CEQA consultant here, so we're um, open to uh, answer uh, any questions for you. So with that, I'm just going to go into the presentation. But thank you again, and uh, hopefully, thank, thank you for your consideration, and hopefully uh, we can move to the next step forward. Um, the project's uh, been open. Both projects have uh, sites have been owned by the Pleasanton Gravel Company for the last uh, 50 years. And as Ashley mentioned, they're vacant grassland, and the intent was to uh, do surface mining there. Um, I have to put on my glasses. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we've been working on this project, uh, as I mentioned, since 19, uh, since 2019 feels like 19 something. Um, but, uh, it's, it's been, it's been a great process. Um, and again, it's been very collaborative. You can go to the next slide, please. So this just gives you an overview. I'm not going to go, uh, go into it. Uh, but the, the plan here, uh, you can see SMP 40, uh, highlighted and, Keep going, thank you. So uh, SMP 39, so what we're doing with SMP 39, we're putting a track map, six parcels. You, you saw a very preliminary site plan. Uh, our, our goal is to really market this property to users, uh, users who are working, uh, creating jobs, high value jobs in the advanced manufacturing business. So I, I feel when we come back to planning commission, you're gonna see a completely different site plan there. Um, I think you'll see more parking there. Um, and, and really working with uh, Livermore IE, IEDD and Brandon on, on bringing potential users to the site. And we're, in fact, actually doing that right now. We've had a few calls uh, with some users who have very unique businesses who need build a suit. So um, I think it's pretty exciting to work on projects like that. And then also we'll be dedicating a substantial portion of land to uh, Widen Jack London Boulevard and the bike trail. Thank you. Uh, I, we can skip that slide. 
Uh, th this is a proposed uh, rendering completely different than uh, SMP 40. So we, we really, the, de the design of the building and the users will be different uh, and they're gonna probably want a more high image building. So SMP 40, two buildings, as Ashley mentioned, we're very fortunate to have pre-leased uh, building one to LAM Research. Um, and building two, we designed the building, if you saw the site plan, to have north-south doors, um, screen loading areas, and our building is 880 to 1,000 feet um, closest to the east uh, residential areas. So we purposely did that. And then also, as, as you know, as a condition, we've limited nighttime traffic. Uh, roofs are to, uh, they're going to accommodate P PV. We also have a TDM to reduce VMTs. Uh, day one, we'll have 75 EV chargers coming into the project. And, and one thing that we're doing, we're trying to anticipate in the future, we're trying to put EV conduit in the truck horse for future EV trucks. So we're running that conduit out there. Obviously, uh, no natural gas, and we hope to commence grading uh, July 15th to meet the schedule for LAM research. Again, you can see the building here. You've seen it, so I'll just move on. This is uh, looking at building two on the south end of building two on the right, and then uh, building one is on the left side. So the benefits, uh, uh, high quality jobs, tens of million dollars of annual salary. Obviously, you know the benefits of the annexation, long-term tax revenue um, for Livermore. Uh, the combination, and this is really the urban planning part of it, the combination of the warehouse distribution and also advanced manufacturing. And then uh, hundreds of new construction jobs, um, sheet metal workers, uh, local 104, IBEW, sprinkler fitters, iron workers, and, and the UAP and S. And, and in fact, uh, you're going to hear from one gentleman tonight who, who's a Livermore-based company uh, that we're going to use as our electrical subcontractor. Thank you. Um, talked about the additional revenue and the jobs, uh, expansion opportunities. We hope to see more expansion opportunities, whether it's in building two or SMP 39. Um, and not only do they you know, keep businesses in Livermore, but it also supports the retail and restaurants. And then the, the Arroyo Mucho trail connection and getting the bikes off of Isabel. Thanks. Uh, briefly on the benefits, it's, they're big numbers. Uh, over $14 million in development fees, uh, one-time uh, LVJ USD fees when uh, we're paying those fees when we get our building permits. And then, you know, you, you think about these small little additions on your property tax bill, but when you have an increased valuation from $189,000 to $120 million on just SMP 40 alone, uh, that's $242,000 a year in school fees uh, or, or $4.8 million dollars. Uh, the same with property taxes and then also uh, funding for parks and recreation. And again, this is just SMP 40. Um, $100,000 uh, contribution, um, as Ashley mentioned, and then, and then the bridge, we're committing $750,000, but also uh, soft costs are, uh, to design these bridges and the work with Caltrans, we might even match that other $750,000. The costs on SMP 39 are very similar again. And, and let me talk about scheduling a little bit. So in our EIR, uh, we have to complete SMP 40 uh, before we can start SMP 39. So it'll also give us a lot of time to really start marketing uh, these buildings to users. Thank you. And that is it. And hopefully I kept it short. And again, I'm available uh, for any questions as well as our consultants. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, that's it for the presentations. Uh, okay, uh, do we have, I'm gonna open the public comment period. Do we have public comments? Yes, sir, we do. Okay. The first speaker is Wang Tan, followed by Nigel Cowan, followed by Robert Downs. <clears throat> uh, let's see how we do that. Hi, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Member. Um, thank you for letting me speak in tonight. Uh, my name is Wing Tam. I'm field representative for Law Cow Carpenter Senior Local 713 in uh, Alameda County. I'm uh, represent personally uh, 37,000 member of uh, Northern California and uh, 4,000 in Alameda County. Over 200 plus 
uh, in here li at Livermore. I'm here tonight uh, with concern uh, regarding uh, Livermore, uh, Overton Moor property uh, proposed uh, SMP 3940 project. The Carpenters Unions have uh, reached out to Overton Moor property multiple times regarding several projects during the whole Alameda County, including the one proposed tonight. Uh, Overton Moor property have history working with a general contractor who did not paying area standards wages benefit on their project. Historically, uh, the subcontractor from uh, out of the area being the own workforces into the town. Uh, for example, Pacific Common South in Fremont may have been a seed project from a uh, developer uh, percent, um, but much of the workforces is from uh, South, Southern California. Um, Nevada, Arizona did not receive healthcare or area standards wages. This is not conductive to environment or health of construction worker. Uh, so here, um, here we, here we are again uh, with other proposed industrial projects in the Bay Area without labor standards. Uh, the applicants proposed the development of ninety three acre. I'm here to asking the city uh, what we're getting in return. Uh, so in there are many um, commitment to put Livermore carpenters into this project. Let's be honest, um, uh, most of carpenter who live in um, Livermore are working in someone else. Uh, if there's some miracle, miracle um, resident to land on this project, they pay profound wages and are entitled with our health care and retirement. Once again, what what we can com uh, community get in return over to more property, uh, not make uh, a commitment to using responsible union general contractor. Uh, a general contractor uh, partner up with uh, NorCal Carpenters Unions have uh, make commit to pay area standards health care and um, support apprentices in Livermore uh, who can opportunity to beginning work. So uh, in, in conclusion, we ask the city council continue approving uh, proposed project to future day. Uh, we asking um, commission request, request this developer to doing the right thing in Livermore and we request uh, labor standards in this project. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Nigel Cowan, followed by Robert Downs, followed by Tyler Roast. Good evening. My name is Nigel Cowan. I'm uh, with West Days Mechanical Corporation. We're uh, headquartered in Hayward, California, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'm a 25 year Tri-Valley resident myself. Um, we're asking that the project be approved to move forward. Um, we, we're currently contracted to furnish the design for the automatic fire sprinkler system on this project. Um, we, we're, we've, we've done numerous projects in uh, the Bay Area, We've worked in Las, at Las Positas, Lawrence Livermore Lab, Sandia, a lot of experience here. Um, again, we're a, a 483 um, union contractor, so great wages here. Um, we have individuals on our payroll that are Livermore residents, so this will create work for them. We absolutely wanna see this, this project move forward more so for the employees we have and, uh, you know, so they can spend their money here locally in Livermore. Thank you. The next speaker is Robert Downs, followed by Tyler Roast, followed by Tim Cooper. Mayor, council members, uh, my name is Robert Downs. Uh, I'm a resident here in Livermore. Um, I'm also a member and an organizer from UA Local 342 with the Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. Um, I also assist in labor investigations here in Alameda County. 
and also right here in our own city. Um, on a daily basis, I see contractors that are involved in uh, wage theft, uh, labor trafficking, um, in such manners, you know, that are bad for companies. Uh, you know, they bring labor from all over the United States and they work right here in our own backyard. So I'm here to speak out for Overton Moore Project because of uh, their longstanding commitment that they've had to the union organizations. Uh, mentioned that they're using a union, you know, local uh, electrical contractor. We just heard West States also talk, uh, which is nice to see that because that includes uh, many of our local guys that live right here, our brothers and sisters and including our apprentices uh, that are used, you know, from our state funded apprenticeship programs that we have in the area. And of course, they didn't stop there. Uh, we heard their commitment that they're giving $750,000, you know, to the trail system. We also heard their commitment to $100,000 to expand the marketing for these jobs, you know, of companies are trying to bring into these facilities. They're not just another fast food company or another storage facility. You know, these are uh, long-term commitment career paths that people can take with uh, LAM research, for example. So uh, as we heard, uh, these are all positive items that we're hearing tonight on this project. Uh, and I urge you guys to vote yes on this project. Uh, and thank you for your time. The next speaker is Tyler Roast, followed by Tim Cooper, followed by Brandon Evans. Good evening, Council. I'm uh, representing Red Top Electric. We are a union contractor in the Alameda County, and we're specific. Um, we are a local contractor as well, located in Livermore. Um, been here 20 years and in Alameda County since 1946, so almost 80 years as a union contractor. I am here to represent the SMP 40 project. And on the behalf of Red Top Electric, as a union contractor, we would like for this project to happen. Uh, many of our workers through the union are local Livermore residents, and we'll be putting those folks to work on this project, along with our office staff, which we have roughly 30 to 40 people in our office, which many of them live here locally in Livermore as well. And we're representing this company or, or this, uh, this project to happen. Um, we really appreciate your your thought on this, and we're excited about this project. Thank you. The next speaker is Tim Cooper, followed by Brandon Evans. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tim Cooper. I am the managing director for LAM Research's North America Manufacturing Operations. So we will be the first tenant in uh, Project uh, SP40. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. I've been with the company for about five and a half years, um, but have run uh, worked in different businesses in Livermore uh, for the past 23 years, and uh, actually a resident uh, just down the street from where this project will be. Uh, for the past eight years. So uh, really excited to see the plan come together and kind of build out that area of the city. Uh, so definitely appreciate the consideration uh, of the council, as well as the hard work that was presented here by the city manager and her staff. Uh, quite impressive work there and kind of humbles me to know that that much work has gone into to what we're going to be doing here. Uh, so again, uh, I'm not going to go through the full description of what LAM research is, but uh, we are a critical uh, supplier within the semiconductor market. And uh, we've now been uh, in the city of Livermore uh, for almost 14 years now. Uh, so definitely appreciate the support that's been given to our company uh, in helping us not just grow, but also evolve our business to meet the challenges of the future. So we're on a pretty uh, uh, important timeline here. Uh, as most of you know, if you've been watching the news with what's going on with semiconductors, uh, there's a real demand that's out there that we're being challenged in that. So this project is actually really key uh, to positioning us for the growth that we see over the next five to six years. And we would definitely like that growth for what we're doing within our company uh, to be here in Livermore. So extremely important project. Uh, really trying to help position us for what the industry is expected to see as a 2x growth uh, over the next five to six years. Uh, 
the location of this facility is also another important factor, which was part of us working with our partners to select this site and that it's in very close proximity to the current factory that we have here in Livermore uh, over off the uh, Las Vecitas, or I think in which you refer to as the Illyville neighborhood. That proximity is very close to help cut down on the trucking traffic between uh, the warehouse and that factory, as well as helping us consolidate multiple warehouses we have today uh, in the Tri-Valley area, as well as in the Central Valley. So we look forward to a successful next outcome on this project and thank you for your consideration. The next speaker is Brandon Evans followed by Jesus Mendoza. Good evening, mayor and council members. My name is Brandon Evans and I'm a business representative with IBW, IBW Local 595 and I represent Union Electricians in Alameda County. Tonight, however, I'm here representing not only union electricians, but over 400 households that make their living as union sheet metal workers, sprinkler fitters, plumbers, and iron workers. I'm speaking tonight from a perspective as an advocate for high quality union construction being built by our local construction workforces who are being paid family supporting wages. I'm also speaking as someone who has been entrusted to advocate for the general welfare of our members who live here in Livermore. The project will also provide workforce related community benefits uh, dozens of area residents will be employed in its construction. This will include many apprentices who are enrolled in the area's training programs that exist within the trades that I speak for tonight. That means that more opportunity for Livermore and Tri-Valley youth at-risk workers to gain entry into career pathways that put them into, uh, well, firmly into America's middle class, excuse me. This incredibly common, or it's incredibly common as construction workers to face long commutes. What isn't always common is having a significant project in your backyard. What's even less common is a city that values work-life balance of its residents and those in surrounding areas like Livermore does. Supporting this project would not only ensure that it is built with skilled and trained workforce, uh, it would also make a positive difference in a lot of local union households. This is the right project being built at the right location. It is bringing good jobs and other much needed community benefits. Please support it. Thank you very much. And the final speaker is Jesus Mendoza. Hello, my name is Jesus Mendoza, and I'm a field rep for the Carpenters Union. Although, you know, Overton Moore is stating that they are using union work, they're not using carpenters, right? And carpentry is 70% of the work. And as my, as my brother Wang had mentioned, you know, there's 200 members that we have here in Alameda County that are ready to be employed, which none of them are going to be employed in this project. You know, um, that's something to consider. We have tried contacting them and informed them that we do have general contractors available that meet that meet stand that meet the standards for this city and for these type of projects that are trained to do these type of projects efficiently, effectively, and fast. You know, and they ignore us. So that's just my comments for that. You know, I'll, and although you know, also the another thing that I do want to mention, the carpenters build the buildings in which we give the other trades, quote unquote, work. And um, they're not responding to our calls. So that's just all. And that concludes public comment. Okay, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, we're getting awfully close to the witching hour of 9 o'clock. Uh, so did you want to take a five-minute break and then come back at 9? Sure, okay. So we're going to take a, a quick five-minute break, and then we'll come back uh, uh, for deliberations. So. Thank you.
Okay, let's uh, get everybody back into their seats and we'll uh, uh, go back to the main event. Yeah, right. I can just uh, tap my, my gavel and uh, we'll wait for the TB30 to count us back in. In five, four, three, two, one. Good evening and welcome back to part two of the uh, March 25th meeting of the Livermore City Council. We just went through uh, the staff presentation on 6.3, which is the project for SMP service mining permit uh, 39 and 40. Uh, we just completed the uh, uh, public hearing portion. I uh, closed the public hearing and we're bringing it back to the council. Uh, so with that, are there questions from the council? Councilmember Branning. Sure. Um, so I have just a couple of questions just to clarify on the project, uh, and I have some comments as well. Uh, first of all, I just want to check because this did come up at the Pleasanton Council meeting for SMP 39. Uh, does that project, is it part of the airport development or uh, is it something different? No, this project is completely independent of uh, the airport development plan. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then I'm just curious for uh, S&P 39, since uh, there was a lot of discussion around that, uh, what kind of businesses would go into the, uh, what, what kind of businesses potentially would go into S&P 39? Sure, I'd like to introduce Brandon Cardwell, our Director of Innovation and Economic Development to um, respond to that question. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Brandon Cardwell, your Director of Innovation and Economic Development. SMP 39, um, through this process, has received a specific kind of zoning that does not allow, except in certain cases, um, for types of uses um, that are considered to be uh, lower job density and lower wage types of jobs, so e-commerce distribution, those types of uses. What we're really targeting with SMP 39 specifically are the types of businesses that have a high job density, have a high job quality, and otherwise contribute to the local economy and quality of life. So think of um, companies like, these are simply illustrative, there's been no conversations with any of these companies about S&P 39, but Monarch Tractor, Form Factor, obviously Lamb Research, Topcon, these companies that have a mix of uses, including office, R&D, advanced manufacturing, and potentially you know, some storage space, um, but there's a strong correlation between smaller building sizes in the 50 to 150,000 square foot range and job dense uh, uses like the ones I've described. Perfect. So we aren't looking at something like an Amazon distribution center there. That's correct. In fact, they're expressly prohibited, um, except in the case of a conditional use permit, and there are restrictions on how much of the space could be used for that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so it sounds like a very high value usage. And then uh, if we were to deny the application in front of us today, uh, what usage would be allowed on the land currently? The uh, properties would continue under their current zoning and designations uh, within Alameda County, which uh, currently include uh, agricultural zoning, but primarily the permits for the surface mining operations that could occur both on 39 and 40. And if it was surface mining, what kind of activity would we expect to see, uh, like trucks, land destruction, that sort of thing? Would we, it would be pretty disruptive, would it not? Yes, yeah, so it could be with the truck trips uh, going back and forth, uh, the general operations um, offloading the material, for example, and transporting it. Okay, uh, so let's just set up just uh, kind of in my opinion for these projects, the current land usage, it has some value, but not a lot. I think it's actually rather destructive. Uh, there have been in mailed comments, environmental concerns in the EIR, we address agriculture, but I don't see this ever being agricultural land. Under current usage, basically trucks could be trucking gravel in and out, uh, causing what I would say is quite a bit of environmental harm uh, versus a project that does have what I think is rather good steward stewardship of the land, uh, puts it into a well thought out plan for high paying jobs, really brings value to the community, is planned out to not be disruptive with a large number of truck trips. Uh, and overall, I think is really a nice project for uh, S&P 40, which we know it's going in there. And the potential for S&P 39 looks really to have a very high potential for the city. 
Um, I would ask the applicant, uh, just if you can, please work with our brothers and sisters in the Carpenters Union. Uh, you know, they are bringing local labor with apprenticeship standards, prevailing wage, whatever you can do. It is really important to me that, you know, they are brought in on the project. Any way you can make that, if you already have something happening where maybe you can bring them in as a partial contractor at least, but those local jobs, the local labor standards are super important to me. Um, I appreciate very much that you're looking to union labor for the remainder of the tasks on the job, but as our brothers in the uh, construct or in the carpenters trade pointed out that they are a major portion of the work and it is something that is, you know, meaningful. It would be very impactful for the neighborhood. It would get a lot of goodwill for you and the company. Uh, I would definitely help going forward. So I would, I don't know if I can condition or not, but I would ask the uh, applicant to please reach out to the carpenters, see if you can get a deal going with them. I think you'll be surprised at how amenable they are at working with you uh, if you just get that conversation going. So if you could please do that, I would appreciate it. Councilor Kick. Uh, just <clears throat> piggybacking a little bit on those job types. Um, this is something that we're looking to do in the city uh, because it's important, um, I believe, to have a housing jobs balance. So we had our housing earlier um, where we talked about the number of units we're supposed to create. We create all those units and there aren't local jobs. It's not meeting our other um private action goals, for example, because people need to commute out to um, to work. So as we eventually push um, those arena numbers up, our high quality jobs need to go up based on the discussion that I've heard um, in, in briefings. It seems that we are bringing in high paying um, jobs and that um, marketing allocation is unique. That's not something we see very often. And the entire goal of that is so that um, your department, Brandon, can do targeted outreach to those high density, high paying jobs, correct? That's correct. You're not going to just spend it on Facebook ads for yourself? No, no, we yeah, will. I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, that it's, it's just a very uh, unique opportunity that the city negotiated, um, which I think just speaks to our commitment to innovation and making sure that we are doing everything we can um, to maintain a, a great jobs housing balance. So thank you for doing that. And thank you to the applicant for being amenable to, um, to that provision. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Barrientos, questions, comments? Oh, I like the idea that we're going to employ the unions. And you know, I'm a union person from the get-go. worked at Portland Makers Union when I was a kid going to college tough job. It's good pain. They try to keep me there. Heck no. Anyway, uh, I appreciate uh, the laborers out there, carpenters, and uh, I hope we really em employ the union and get them involved. Let them have the bite of the apple. I think it would be a great uh, deal for the city and the school district. It seems like everybody's going to get something out of here instead of uh, you know, let sit there and the mining company look for more gravel. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, people understand it's not the expansion of the airport because I got those comments and I can't understand why they think that's going to happen. No, the airport's in a little box and they're not going to expand out of there. But it will help the city a lot. And I appreciate the staff and uh, I, I enjoyed the nice reading here. But uh, thank you very much. Vice Mayor. Uh, thanks for the report, Ashley. I do have, I'm curious about most of this material that we received today. I assume you read this. Is, can you comment on on uh, this concern of theirs? Yes, I, I believe you're holding up the letter from the Golden State yes. Environmental Justice Alliance Group. Right. That we that we apparently received Friday. Yes, yeah. uh, that is dated Friday. 
Um, so that letter uh, is actually a set of comments that we that were very similar to a comments that we received uh, after the or rather during the draft environmental impact report. Um, in summary, the, the comment discusses the modeling that was done, primarily uh, the air quality modeling for construction um, for the project. And um, the commenter essentially uh, disagrees with the way that uh, we modeled uh, the construction emissions in the project. Um, however, the uh, construction emissions were modeled based on project specific information. Um, that was supplied to our consultant team uh, from the developer uh, and applicant team um, who are very familiar with the uh, duration of some of these processes in terms of construction operations and actually them supplying that project specific information helped our analysis become um, even more accurate in the modeling and that was uh, what we responded to initially in the in the final EIR which included a response to their comments during the draft EIR period um, this comment letter seems to uh, just continue to to disagree with with that approach, but staff uh, and our consultant team stands with our approach and our EIR and that it was adequate and resulted in um, appropriate level of impact or accurate level of impacts. Okay, thank you. I was uh, confident that you had um, done due diligence on that, but it, since it was arrived so recently, I just wanted to see what uh, what we had worked on uh, earlier during the EIR um, timeline. The other thing, I just wanted to com uh, compliment the Planning Commission for their review of this. I think they did a nice job. I, was, I always look forward to reading their comments that we get and um, the due diligence that they go through in terms of making sure that everything uh, fits what they care about. I will also commend you on the bike route. Um, of the three choices, I can't imagine. I I frequently ride that bike ride over there, and I can't imagine option one or two uh, would be pretty risky for a bicyclist. So I appreciate option three. Uh, it's expensive. I realize that, but it's certainly the most uh, safe, uh, providing safety to to those that are want to bike that area and uh, connect with. Uh, the Iron Horse Trail and so on. So I appreciate that as well. And I know that the Planning Commission has some avid cyclists on it as well. And I'm sure they had their own a particular point of view. So again, thanks very much for the report. Thanks for uh, commenting on this uh, particular um, item that I brought up and I appreciate the uh, report. Thanks. Well, very good. Again, thank you very much for the uh, the in-depth analysis. Uh, I greatly appreciate that. Um, I noted the the, uh, the comments from some of the uh, the commenters about uh, uh, some disagreement about uh, the birds of uh, prey, uh, uh, birds of uh, conservation concern, and species of special concern. Um, certainly appreciate the uh, the staff comments to that. Uh, the staff response in respect to uh, the protection of the riparian habitat, uh, which I think was important to a lot of folks, and that uh, uh, to amplify a little bit of what uh, Councilmember Branning mentioned, the noise impacts and the, uh, uh, the what we would have if this building, these buildings didn't go in, it'd be a quarry. Uh, we're talking about two years of construction uh, versus 30 years of quarrying. Uh, and again, you talk about uh, uh, dust and noise and uh, um, vehicle emissions uh, on balance would be much, much greater uh, uh, impacts of that. Um, there was some disagreement uh, about the avian breeding system or avian breeding season. Uh, so uh, just make sure that that's corrected in the final document. And that uh, um, with that, I think everything else has been, oh, um, the, uh, they talked about uh, habitat fragmentation uh, and that that was uh, had happened over the years, and that was something that that struck me because in the last conversation that we had, we were talking about buying lands east of Livermore just to create wildlife corridors, uh, so we didn't have that fragmentation. So it's just that we're anticipating these uh, for future development as well, so that uh, that we can preserve these lands, preserve the habitat, so we don't have fragmentation like we're dealing with uh, in, on this site. 
Uh, so again, on balance, uh, great, uh, great information, great comments. Uh, and with that, if there's uh, no further discussion, I'd be willing to entertain a motion. I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. Uh, motion made by Vice Mayor Carling, seconded by Council Member Kick. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, and to uh, uh, Evan, uh, to uh, Council Member Branning and Barry Anto's comments about uh, uh, conversation with the, the Carpenters Union. Uh, with that, um, it, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, with that, moving on to item seven, matters initiated and report out. Councilmember Brientos, we'll take it from your side this time. Okay. Well, I attended uh, Ava for a director's meeting and we had two long closed sessions, which tends to make it difficult for us to leave our parking area. Um, and then uh, I also was invited by the Hong Kong what, Film Festival. Mm -hmm. I guess we all were. And I took them up on it and I went up to uh, Sonoma with my wife and she enjoyed, we enjoyed one of the two movies. And, uh, and the other thing we were just playing with is uh, reception. Instead of Chinese cuisine, we had chips and you know, hummus and wine from Selma, Napa. <laughs> I did get to meet the, the mayor of uh, Napa, and they were also concerned about affordable housing and things like that, too. Well, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Brennan. Sir. Sure. Uh, so not too much to add off on top of the items that uh, are in the report out. I just wanted to uh, kind of reiterate from, I was at the Cal City's uh, Housing and Economic Development Policy Committee, and there are a lot of laws currently in the legislation. We did have our ledge packet today also, um, but there are a lot of things that will be affecting us very directly that are currently on the floor. Um, so I know we are tracking those and keep an eye on what they mean. Uh, and I'm interested to see how this goes, but it'll be, it's going to be a busy year for staff. So thank you for all you do, keep up the hard work. And then the mayor may speak about this also. The two of us were attended the Young Men's Service League uh, and got to speak about what the city does. It was a class of freshman students from Livermore it was wonderful speaking to them. They were very polite. They're taller than any of the freshmen I <laughs> hang out with. It was, uh, but it was very nice uh, getting to talk to them, fill them in on what the city does, giving them a tour of the council chambers, and really just seeing a very engaged young group of men. That's where we kick. Um, I have no official action to report. However, we had our um, committee members today, and I'm really excited to see, um, although I may have had a different opinion earlier, the new beautification committee has a bunch of really smart people on there, and I'm excited to see them support our public works department. Um, a lot of um, environmentally uh, well-educated folks on how we can use um, uh, green space use to support our climate action goals. So I look forward to seeing um, what they do there. And there was something else, but clearly it wasn't that important because I forgot. So um, moving on. All right, very good. Uh, Vice Mayor Carling. Thank you. I uh, Just a couple of things that I think was interesting over the last couple of weeks. Um, and the board chair for LAVMA, the Livermore Amateur Valley Water Management, Amateur Valley Water Management Agency. <laughs> you can see why I was asking about INSP earlier because <laughs> I can't even remember the ones I've. Anyway, the uh, general manager. So if you, you want to know what LAVMA is, the water, wastewater from Livermore gets pumped over to Pleasanton. Pleasanton 
wastewater gets pumped there, and then the Dublin San Ramon uh, Sanitary District also ends up there, and then they pump all of that over the hill uh, to San Leander and then into the bay. Clean water by that time. Anyway, the general manager is retiring, and so I was, uh, uh, Mayor and I, uh, interviewed some very good candidates last week, um, and um, our responsibility to select a new general manager that will lead that agency. And um, uh, I think we made a good selection. It remains, I guess, up to the uh, attorney with that particular organization to negotiate a contract with that individual. But uh, anyway, the point of all that is, is that beyond just the meetings that we sometimes go to, we also have the responsibility of selecting uh, individuals that will then lead that organization beyond even my tenure uh, on the lap of board. So uh, it's an important position. And uh, some of the responsibilities that we all have, apart from uh, our own council, uh, responsibilities that you see on Monday nights uh, twice a month. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I did uh, enjoy uh, Meals on Wheels uh, last week. Again, that was a, it's very, very meaningful. And if I don't know whether I mentioned this earlier, but there are nine routes in Livermore. And um, so people go out, as Carrie mentioned, five days a week with meals. And it's no wonder they need so many volunteers because they uh, have a great organization that's well run. Uh, but please, if you have the time or financial resources to help them out, please do if you have a chance. Uh, the only other thing I was gonna mention was the Tri-Valley Energy Summit that I attended uh, uh, Innovation Tri Valley sponsored it. It was over at Ruby Hills uh, Winery there um, off of Isabel. And um, there was a panel on hydrogen, and it was very interesting. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, a fuel for the future and fuel cells. And uh, there was representatives from a local uh, company that's out actually out at Eygate. Uh, yeah proposing to build a hydrogen fueled aircraft. Uh, There's an individual that used to work for me at Sandia uh, <laughs> on the panel on hydrogen. So I got to renew an acquaintance with him, but it was really quite interesting. And I think that it shows the kind of technology that this community is uh, behind in terms of addressing climate change. So again, I appreciate what ITV does and bringing the community together. There must've been a couple of hundred people there, I mm -hmm. suppose, right? Um, whoever was there. I know Brandon was there. Mayor was there. But anyway, that was it was a good crowd. And uh, again, I think it points out what what we're trying to do in the in the Tri Valley and in Livermore to advance uh, clean energy and and being responsible stewards for the environment. So thank you. And uh, by the way, you were were a founding member of Innovation Tri Valley. You were a founding board yeah, member. So yeah, uh, that's true. It's uh, <laughs> look at the great things. And I gave as well. Us. So, yeah, that's with right. Brandon. That's oh. right. Um, yeah. So uh, it shows how long, how long I've been around. This is the yeah, third no general manager for Lavma that I've hired. Yes. Okay. The third interview series that I've done for uh, for Lavma, and again, great, uh, very, very highly talented people. Uh, just a couple of uh, highlights. Uh, the uh, Livermore Valley Arts uh, had a, uh, a reception at the Bankhead Theater featuring the Chagall windows. There are 12 Chagall windows that are at a medical center in Jerusalem. Uh, they're spectacular. Uh, there are a series of prints that are uh, yeah. uh, on display at the Bankhead Theater in the lobby. Uh, we also had a uh, Livermore Rotary International Student Program uh, here at the Mendenhall Room where we had uh, students from all over the world uh, had come to Livermore to learn how uh, local government works. Uh, the uh, there was an artist art uh, Livermore Art Association reception for the Essential uh, Figure Art Show, uh, and that was uh, another local artist that uh, uh, working in the figurative space. So that's uh, we've got a, an extraordinarily talented community here, and it's uh, very gratifying to to be working in that space. Uh, I also attended a uh, an Eagle Scout Court of Honor for uh, uh, Sebastian Mena, who's in the 10th grade. Uh, and uh, normally they hang on to like 18 years old and they, they just get under the wire. Uh, Sebastian Mena and uh, Xavier Thorpe uh, both made their uh, Eagle Scouts. And of course, the vice mayor is an Eagle Scout as well. So we sort of... 
Oh, very good. Very good, Paul. So uh, sometimes we wrist wrestle to see who gets to go to these courts of honor. So uh, certainly appreciate uh, and, and recognize the, the great work that uh, setting a goal and then achieving it. Uh, as far as matters initiated, um, I remember it was like four years ago, uh, I worked to get into the CIP. Um, it took me eight years to get the Holmes wall fixed. Uh, just to, well, but at least I got, you know, I got the first, the, the part where those falling down we got that done, um, but uh, that was eight years. Um, but because of, of neighborhood opposition and litigation, uh, so I figured we'll get started early on this. What I'd like to do is to start the process. As I said, I put it into the CIP four years ago to start working on replacing the, the grape stake fence. Uh, and I drive by it every day and between El Caminito uh, and Catalina, it's looking pretty sad. So if we could get that, if I can get the consensus from the council here to start working on that, can I get, can I get a few head nods? Okay, I got it, thanks. Um, well, we put it in there four years ago, but it's just a matter of getting the plan together to make, we, we started putting funding in there. Uh, we just didn't have it, we don't have a plan yet. So I think I got five nods up here so we could start that process and maybe it wouldn't be eight years <laughs> until we see some replacement. So great, okay, excellent, well, thank you. Uh, all right, well, in that case, um, I believe we have, a, there's a special meeting on April 1st. Oh, okay, we don't. No, Mr. Mayor, we do not have a special meeting. Um, our next meeting will be on April 15th, okay. but the April 1st special meeting has not been canceled yet. Okay, so. very good. It was in, it was in my notes, and I just thought I'd, I'd check and make sure. Uh, so with that, our next meeting is uh, April 15th. And with that? April 8th, right? April 15th uh, this year, uh, we adopted uh, a calendar this year that's a little bit different to recognize uh, conflicts with holidays. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay, so April 15th, uh, we'll see you back here. And with that, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.